Hey, Refuge family, we are so glad that you have decided to join us for church at home today. If it's safe and you're able, we encourage you to gather with your family members or roommates. And if you're worshiping alone, know that your Refuge family worships together with you in spirit. Make sure before you begin to grab a Bible and a slice of bread or a cracker and a cup of juice or wine for communion. So similar to our Sunday gatherings, we are going to lead you in singing, a time of prayer, in communion, and a short sermon. We will also be providing some discussion questions at the end. And if you have younger kids, we encourage you to check out the Refuge Kids link below. Finally, before we get started, the best way to give right now is through our online secure platform at refugeabq.com give. Thank you for joining us and being Refuge Church at home. Hey everybody, welcome to Refuge Church at Home. We're glad you decided us to join us this week. Uh, if this is your first time joining, my name is David. Uh, welcome. Each week, God invites us into this moment, wherever we're worshiping and however we're worshiping, uh, to come before Him honestly. We hope that over the next few minutes, God will speak and He will transform us by the good news of Jesus and that will be sent into our homes, into our workplace if we're working, wherever we're at, to live for God's glory and for the good of our city. As we begin our time today, I want to read from Psalm 31. It's a prayer that asks God to be our refuge, to be our rock and our fortress. Allow God to invite you into worship and allow God to use these words as your own prayer. Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. A little farther down, it says, my times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Let's go before God in song today. Mm -hmm. 
our need for God. Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Oh Lord. Have mercy some time now to pray as we continue in worship. I'll lead us in a few different movements and you can pray out loud or under your breath or silently, whatever feels comfortable uh, for you. Let's start by closing your eyes, breathe in deep, let your mind settle. Remember you're weak, remember how you're feeling. Turn all this into prayer. Pray for yourself. Take some time now to pray for those that you know. Maybe you've heard a prayer request in the last week or so, or you know of somebody in your family or friends or coworkers that uh, could use prayer. Just pray for that one person, whoever God brings to mind. <laughs> 
take some time to pray for our world. There are a lot of burdens that are being carried right now, and we trust that God hears us and that He responds and that He's mighty. Pray for our world. together by praying out loud the Lord's Prayer. The words will be on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to now enter into a time of communion. If you don't feel like this is right for you or for your family, feel free to skip this section. For those of you who are going to take communion, what you're going to do is you're going to take the bread and the cup and you're going to hand it to the person next to you. Allow them to tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the wine or grape juice. And as they're taking it, you can speak these words over them. The body and blood of Christ given for you. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes this. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. this time, if you can have somebody pull out a Bible, open up to Ephesians 5 and read Ephesians 5, verse 21 through chapter 6, verse 9. Well, this should be fun. Uh, I don't have time to treat all sections equally here. But I'm guessing your interest and curiosity for this passage is not in all sections equally. So we will be focusing on the husbands and wives section. Uh, But in verses uh, 5 through 9 of chapter 6, Paul addresses slaves and masters, which I know can be very confusing to our ears given the history of American slavery. We can't help but read the tragedy of our own history into this passage and subsequently blame Paul for not living 1,500 years later. There are significant differences between modern American slavery, ancient Greco-Roman slavery. I can't get into that right now. Let me just say this. Think about verses 5 through 9 as being for us about employers and employees. And then think about what it might mean for us Today, The section before in verses 1 through 4 is about children and parents, uh, specifically fathers are addressed in verse 4, and we're just going to have to skip that as well. I'm guessing some of you parents were really hoping I'd spend significant time on verse 1, but we don't have the time, so kids, it looks like you get a free pass. So now for the fun part, husbands and wives. Before we start in verse 21, 
The entire section that we're looking at, verse 21 through chapter 6, verse 9, is known by scholars as the Ephesian Households Code. And that phrase, Households Code, uh, comes from the fact that this type of moral exhortation towards different members of a household was quite common in ancient literature. Back in the 4th century BC, Aristotle discusses household relationships actually when he's writing a treatise on politics and how a state ought to be ordered. Uh, in his mind, since the Greek state was composed of Greek households, the stability of the, of the state depended upon the stability of the household. And so because of that, in his treatise on politics, he there addresses three pairs within the household. Three pairs in which there is one subordinate and one superordinate, one uh, person of higher social status and one person of lower social status. So he addresses husband-wife, that's the first pair, father-child, master-slave just like in our passage. And in the centuries to follow, a Greek and Roman ethicists and philosophers followed suit in, in, the, in um, doing the same sort of thing. And the instructions that they give, they would give were always essentially the same. To the social inferiors or the social subordinates in each pair, they were called to submit themselves or to obey and the social superior in each pair was commanded to rule over. Uh, that's how you maintain an ordered society. And that's how you maintain an ordered household. Now, on the surface, you've already read this. Uh, on the surface, it looks like Paul is just towing the party line, right? It looks like Paul is just going along with the status quo and simply giving spiritual justification to the way society already functioned. But is he? I guess that's the key question, isn't it? Let's begin by looking at verse 21 of chapter 5. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, or submit yourselves out of reverence for Christ. Now, do you see how there's a section break between verse 20 and verse 21? in the NRSV. In other translations, I think it might be the ESV, there's actually a break between verse 21 and verse 22. But if you look closely at the original Greek language, there shouldn't be a section break anywhere. The first two words here in verse 21, be subject, are representing in English one word in the original Greek. And that word is a participle. Now, I'm going to have to give you a quick grammar lesson here, okay? A participle is a verb, often an ing verb, that functions in a non-verb way, meaning it functions either as an adjective or an, or an adverb. It's a verb ending in ing that modifies or explains or expands something else. Uh, perhaps, again, it modifies another verb. So give me, let me give you a short example. She walked home singing. Okay? Singing is a participle, an ing verb, that modifies or explains how she walked home, right? Walked home is the main verb. Singing is the part of participle that expands or modifies it. You with me so far? Okay, so verse 21 is more literally then, because it's a participle, here it is. Let me give you a more literal translation. Subjecting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that's confusing. That, that doesn't sound like a complete sentence, does it? And it's not. It's confusing because we're wondering, well, where's the main verb? Well, the main verb is all the way back in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then after that, Paul actually expands or explains that main verb, being filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, with five consecutive participles. So listen to what he's saying now. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. How, Paul? Well, let me give you some participles. <laughs> singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. That's number one. Singing in the Greek, it's a different word for singing, but it's translated the same here. Making melody to the Lord in your hearts. That's number three. Giving thanks to the God the Father at all times. That's number four. And oh wait, there's one more. Subjecting to one another another 
out of reverence for Christ. That's the fifth. It's one sentence, essentially. Now, why do translators break it up into multiple sentences for us? Well, because we don't talk like that. We prefer shorter sentences, right? The point I'm making from this is that Paul is explaining here what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. And according to Paul, it looks like worshiping joyously and freely, right? It looks like living with gratitude towards God, and then it looks like submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does it mean to submit to one another? Um, it doesn't mean obey. Uh, that's actually a different word that's used only for children down in chapter six, verse one. Uh, put negatively, I think to submit is certainly to not rebel against or to go against. Put positively, I think it means to defer to, to be willing to follow. And that's how, according to verse 21, both men and women are to behave towards each other in the church, right? All of this stuff is to everybody. It's not just one group of people that aren't supposed to get drunk with wine and be filled with the Spirit. It's everybody. Everybody should be singing psalms and hymns. Everybody should be giving thanks to God the Father. Everybody should be doing the fifth participle, subjecting to one another out of reverence for Christ or submitting to one another. All right, let's continue. Verse 22. Wives... Be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. Okay, so I promise we'll pick up the pace in a little bit. But what's kind of crazy about this verse is that you know how verse 21 was missing a main verb, though it had a participle? Verse 22 is missing a verb altogether. There's not even a participle. Literally in the Greek, it should be translated, wives to your husbands as you are to the Lord. That's what it says in the Greek. Now, how does that work? Well, it's part of the same preceding sentence. So let me read verse 21 and 22 together because they belong together. Submitting yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands. Here's the point. Verse 22 is an application of verse 21. It's the same sentence. Wives are asked to do in verse 22 what all Christians are asked to do in verse 21. Another way of putting this is to say that the reason wives are asked to submit to their husbands in verse 22 is because it is their application of verse 21. You could say that Paul is urging Christian wives here to not act one way in the church and so obey verse 21, and another way at home, the same kind of mutual submission that Paul calls the church to as they interact with each other in verse 21 is the same kind of submission he calls wives to. That's what's going on in the grammar here. And I think this answers actually one of the questions we might have about this verse. Oh, is Paul telling wives that they have to be doormats, that they have to endure physical abuse, that they have to just smile all the time and bow down to their husband's every wish and command? And the answer is, well, only if that's what Paul is calling all of us to do towards each other, right? So no, of course not. Paul is not calling them to do anything beyond what he calls all Christians to do. Let's continue, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Okay, so our understanding of these two verses here comes down to a single Greek word, translated in verse 23 as head. If you read up on this word, the Greek word is kephale, you'll see it's one massive brawl in the scholarship. <laughs> and let me, let me uh, um, give you both sides of the fight over this particular word. Uh, first, side A. Side A says that kephale means authority or leader, uh, like a head of household or head of state. Uh, this is what they say, Side A says, it almost always means uh, when it's used metaphorically in the New Testament, when head is used metaphorically in the New Testament. And an example they give is earlier in Ephesians. Ephesians 1.22 says, referring to Christ, and he, God, has put all things under his feet and made him the 
head over all things. In the context, it's very clearly referring to Christ's authority over everything. And it makes sense as a metaphor because our heads lead or control our bodies to some sense, right? And it also makes sense in its ancient context. This was in fact the husband's role in the ancient world to lead their families of which their wives were included. So here then is Paul's logic according to side A. Wives ought to submit to their husbands because the husband is their leader, just as the church submits to Christ because Christ is its leader. Does that make sense? You with me so far? That's side A. Okay, here's side B. Side B says that kephale means source, like headwaters. Uh, the headwaters are not the ruler of a, a stream or body of water. It's, it's the source of a river or stream from which the river or stream is supplied its water, right? Um, and, and they say this is actually, contrary side A, this is what it almost always means when it's used metaphorically in the New Testament. An example is earlier in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, uh, verse 15 and 16, we looked at this recently. We must grow up into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom, not over whom, from whom the whole body promotes the body's growth. So Christ in that verse is the source from whom the body grows. It's the source of the body's growth. Uh, Colossians 2 is another, uh, 2.19 is another example. It uses very similar language to Ephesians 4, talking about Christ and the church. Paul warns the Colossians against, quote, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body grows with a growth from God. So again, Christ is, as kephale, is the source of the body's growth. And this metaphorical meaning, according to side B, also makes sense. How does your body receive what it needs to survive? Food, water, air, through your head, right? Our heads are the means by which our bodies get what they need to grow and survive. And this also makes sense, they say, of the ancient world, because a husband's role in the ancient world was to provide the raw materials needed for life. They supplied the wool, which the wives would use to make the clothes. They would supply the food, which the wives would use to feed the family. The husband in the ancient world was the source of the wife's material and physical well-being. This why, of course, uh, widowhood was such a problem in the ancient world and why Paul, numerous times in his letters, has to give instructions to the churches for the proper care of widows, for wives who'd lost their husbands. What's then Paul's logic here according to side B in this verse? Wives ought to submit to their husbands because the husband is their source or provider, just as Christ is the source or provider for the church. In other words, Paul is actually urging here proper reciprocity. It's only right for wives to treat their husbands as all Christians are to treat each other, verse 21, given what the husband provides, given his role as Kefale. Okay, I know you're probably gonna have to put pause, rewind, go back to that. I packed a lot of argumentation into just a few minutes. Um, but those are the two interpretive possibilities. And really deciding between the two, they're both strong. <laughs> they both have, uh, uh, they're both rooted in the text, in, our, in the language, in our understanding of ancient cultures. Deciding between the two is impossible right now because we'd have to then look at a variety of other texts in the New Testament, specifically uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But listen, I think it may not matter as much as we think for understanding what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 5. Not if we continue looking at what Paul says specifically to husbands. So let's read that now. Actually, sorry, before we read that, I wanna make one note, okay? Do you remember what I said earlier about ancient household codes? How the social subordinate was called upon to submit and the social superordinate or the one in superior social status was called upon to what? To rule over, right? So if Paul was just towing the party line, just mimicking whatever pagan philosophers and ethicists would say, what would we expect him to tell husbands at this point? To rule over their wives, right? But now let's actually look at what Paul does say in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives 
just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word so as to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, another translation says. This is a great metaphor, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. Okay, notice in verse 26 and 27. Look at verse 26 and 27 again. What actions is, does Christ here do for the church, which husbands are then to emulate? There's a, there's a kind of a twofold action that, that, that Christ does for the church that husbands are to emulate. I don't know if you caught it but it's bathing and laundering. <laughs> Not laundering money, <laughs> laundering clothes, right? Washing of water by the word, but then it's not just bathing. Notice that it says, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle. So he's not just talking about bathing, he's talking about washing clothes, right? He's removing spots, he's ironing things out, right? Obviously it's metaphorical, but that's a description of Christ's relationship to the church. And what's interesting is that this uh, verse here, actually these verses actually has a pretty strong parallel text in the Old Testament that describes God's relationship to Israel, what he does, does for Israel. Uh, but to understand it, uh, an important point here needs to be made. In the ancient world, it was a woman's role to first assist in childbirth. It would either be a midwife or a female servant in the household or a female relative. Um, it was her job to assist in childbirth, so they would, they would cut the umbilical cord, they would wash the infant, they would rub salt all over the infant, apparently it was for antiseptic purposes, and they would then wrap, finally wrap the child in cloth, right? That's how they assisted in childbirth. And then continuing on uh, caring for children as they grew up, it was the mother's role, again a woman's role, but specifically the mother, to bathe and wash and provide clothes, do the laundry for not just the child, but for everyone in the household. If the mother was raising a daughter, she would do this for the daughter until the daughter reached puberty. Until the daughter, sorry, we have to go there, the daughter started menstruating, at which time she would become of childbearing age and eventually she'd be married off and then the daughter would assume these responsibilities. Um, okay, so with that said, in Ezekiel 16, we're not gonna turn there, you can read it on your own sometime. In Ezekiel 16, God uses all of this to metaphorically describe how he's related to Israel and what he's done for them. He says, he found infant Israel abandoned in a field as an infant, and, and no one had cut the umbilical cord, it says. So still attached to the placenta. Sorry, we're getting graphic. No one had washed the infant. No one had salted the infant. No one had wrapped the infant in cloth. But God took her. Normally, Israel is referred to as a son, but in this passage, Israel is a daughter. God took her, and as she grow, grew up, and she began sorry, menstruating, it says that God washed her of her blood and then he clothed her in these rich and wonderful fabrics. Why? Well, so as to present her for marriage. And at this point then it's interesting because the metaphor flips and now God is the husband who is taking Israel as his bride. Here's the point. In Ezekiel chapter 16, God does women's work. Right? It's metaphorical, obviously, but he does, the metaphor that's used is that he does women's work, the work of a social subordinate, to care for Israel into maturity. Why? To make her glorious and beautiful and stunning and looking like a thousand bucks, looking like royalty. Now, back to Ephesians chapter 5. Notice that that's what Christ has done for the church. He has done what would have been considered women's work, 
to care for the church in the maturity, to make her glorious, to make her beautiful, to make her stunning like royalty. And of course, just like in Ezekiel 16, Christ, you'll notice, is also the husband. So the metaphor flips. Now, what does this mean? Remember, this is how husbands are to treat their wives. They are to do women's work, to do the kind of work that subordinates do. In verse 29, it also says, he talks about nourishing and tenderly caring for a wife as you nourish and tenderly care for your own body. Here's what all of this means. Let's grant side A and say that kephle means leader or authority. What kind of leadership then ought the husband be providing as the kephle? According to Paul, the kind that does women's work towards their wives. What that means is that they exercise the kind of leadership that gets low, right? That assumes lower status, that acts like a subordinate and serves. Now listen, I'm not saying here that men need to cook and clean and do the laundry, nor am I saying that women have to cook and clean and do the laundry. You'll notice that Paul doesn't actually really go into gender roles. He doesn't talk about how decisions should be made exactly. He doesn't talk about who should do what in the household. A lot of that is gonna be culturally determined. That's certainly not Paul's concern. I think Paul's concern is that both wives and husbands learn in their own ways to act out verse 21, which you'll remember supplies the initial verb for this entire section. Listen, this is, I think, a challenge to both progressives and traditionalists when it comes to the gender role debate. You know, traditionalists might like parts of this verse, you know, they, they like the part that maybe talks about uh, the husband as the kephle, and, and that means that, that men need to lead their homes and lead their marriages. And, and they may be right to a point, but they don't get to define what leadership looks like. Paul gets to define what leadership looks like. And so it really depends upon what you mean by leading your home. Do you mean by leading, nourishing, tenderly caring, treating your wife as the superior in the relationship, assuming the role of the subordinate? Paul calls husbands to love, love their wives in this way, and in so doing, I think he's calling husbands to, in their own way, act out verse 21 mutually submitting yourselves to each other out of reverence for Christ. But then on the opposite side, you know, perhaps it's the, it's the progressive side, they might like certain parts of this verse and not others. They, they might love verse 21, but in so doing, they want to ignore verse 22. But if you conclude from this passage that Paul isn't calling wives to submit to their husbands, you've completely missed it. He is, in fact, calling wives to submit to their husbands. They are to treat their husbands with the deference and humility and willingness to follow that is to be the hallmark of all Christian relationships. You know what I think is wrong with both sides? Or what both sides struggle with? It's what we all struggle with. Nobody wants verse 21, which, remember, supplied the participle that kicked off this entire section. All of us, by staring so much at the later verses, want so desperately to avoid verse 21. Another way of putting this is that I think one of the primary problems with the application of this passage is that we so desperately want the other person in the pair to go first. Right? We so desperately are hoping that the Holy Spirit right now is speaking very powerfully to the other person in the pair. Did you hear that? That's the nudge of the Holy Spirit, right? If only we say, if only she would go first and just for once defer to me, just once let me lead and be willing to follow. Or the husband says, if, or the wife says, if only once he would just tenderly care for me. If only once he would treat me as being the superior in the relationship. If the, only, if the other person would just go first. But of course, we know this. 
who should go first? You. You should go first, <laughs> right? Two questions that I leave you with, or I wanna, I wanna ask and answer real briefly at the end here. How? How do we find the strength to go first? H how do we find the ability or the strength to act out what none of us want to do? None of us want to subject ourselves. None of us want to defer. None of us want to just, just let the other person kind of take the lead on certain matters, right? We want our way. How do we find the strength? Well, I think the key is hidden in plain sight. It's the metaphor that's in the very center of our text. It is our connection to the head who is Christ, right? Christ will supply our strength, our connection to Christ, not the willingness of the other person to go first. It is our connection to Christ who went first. It is our connection to Christ that allows us to go first. The second question, the final question is this. Okay, supposing we have the strength to do this. Now, what does this mean to apply in our marriages? if we're married. What does this look like for us to apply? What should I do differently this afternoon? What should I do differently this week? Well, again, I think the key is hidden in plain sight. Do you remember not the participle, but the main verb? Verse 18. It's all part of the same section. Be filled with the Spirit. I think we can trust that the Spirit is going to lead us. <laughs> I think we can trust that the Spirit is going to speak to us. Trust the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit so that we might take this and act it out faithfully today and in the week to come. Let's pray. God, would you supply us the strength to listen to your word and to submit to it? And to obey it and so show our spouses not just our spouses but all those around us our households our co-workers show them you Jesus when others look at our relationships with one another may they see you may they see your love may they see your care in Jesus name we pray amen We've provided some sermon discussion questions to help you uh, go a little bit deeper and, and begin exploring what it might look like for you to apply uh, this passage into your life this week. I wanna leave you with a, a benediction again from Ephesians, but Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.